Lord Jesus, you did what no one else could do. You conquered sin and death and hell. You silenced all the lies of the enemy. And you reign and rule in the truth of your gospel. And so this day we thank you. We worship you and we celebrate what you have done. That you, the truth of heaven, have become the truth of our lives. And for those who don't yet know you, you could be that. Your arms are open. You welcome us this day. So receive our worship. Receive the praise that we lift up. And be glorified in the praises of your people. We pray this, Jesus, for your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Someone say amen and feel free to have a seat. Well, we've been talking about really understanding the truth of God in a world that doesn't always understand that truth. And, uh, and today, we're going to be addressing the topic of sexuality, a very biblical talk, topic. The Bible talks a lot about uh, us as men and women and how God's designed us and, and us as sexual people. Uh, and I want to ask you to do something for me as we're together today, uh, whether you're online or on campus, I'm going to ask that as I talk, as I, and we're going to walk through a number of biblical passages we're going to try to understand what the scripture says. What we do every week we gather at Shoreline Church is we're saying, what does God's word have to say? How do we follow his word and how does it transform our lives? And through our lives, hopefully, how does it transform our world? And so as I'm talking today about this, this really a topic that you might have not have noticed, but it's become a point of conflict for a lot of people, a lot of discussion, a lot of disagreement about sexuality. Always has been throughout history, but, but really right now in this moment in history, it's a very intense conversation. And so as I'm talking about this, as I'm walking through the scriptures, if there's something you hear that you just kind of in your heart or your mind, you might disagree with or say, boy, I don't, I push back on that or I don't really fully understand that. I'm going to ask you to hang in there, to stay with me. Don't, don't click off mentally. Uh, don't, don't click off in terms of your listening, but just say, I really want to hear what God's word has to say. And maybe if, if it challenges my thinking, I'm open to that. But I'm asking you just to kind of hang in there. So, so if there's something that, you, that rubs against you the wrong way or that you don't really understand or don't affirm, hang in there. Now, I want to say to those of you that maybe I'm going to share something and you really strongly agree with it, like you really agree with it, I'm going to ask you to feel free to give the loudest amen you'd like to silently in your heart. <clears throat> Everybody following me? Um, this is the kind of topic that if somebody goes, Amen! It can kind of feel like it's becoming a, a, a battle or a, a point of contesting each other. That's not what we're seeking to do. We're seeking to look to the word of God and to learn from his truth. Now, I like a hearty out loud amen most Sundays, but today I'm going to ask if you have an amen, keep it in your heart. If you want to break out into applause, do that as well in your heart. Uh, but I want, what I want us to do is, to, is just to come with humble hearts, all of us, and say, God, what, do you, what does your word have to say about how you've made us? Something that, that, that is, has become a point of real tension, a real conflict. So Jesus, this is our prayer today. Hmm. That you would speak to each of our hearts. That if there's areas that we are in a line with your word and your beautiful, good, and glorious plan for our lives as men and women, Lord, that you would speak to us about that. If there's areas that maybe we've wandered and, and we've uh, been captured by some of the thinking of the world and the current of the world and you need to redirect us, redirect our thinking or even our lives. Lord, we're open to that. We pray, God, that you would speak to us, that you would teach us through this time, <clears throat> and that you would reveal exactly what you want us to know. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, the message I'm going to share with you is sexuality is God's design, uh, or God's design for sexuality is very good. God's design for us as men and women, God's design for sexuality is very good. When I count to three, say very good. One, two, three. Very good. It is. That's God's design. Look with me. Turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible, first chapter. We're going to start at the very, very beginning. And I'm going to first talk about some truths that we should embrace. How do we embrace the truth that God reveals in his word, in this book? How do we embrace that truth? And we're going to start by looking at how we embrace the truth, and then how do we live out that truth? So first, embracing the truth. Here's the first thing I want us to think about. Sexuality is God's design, and it is a very good design. God planned us and made us to be different, to be men and to be women. Look with me at Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. 
so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This is God speaking in his Trinitarian community. Let us make man and women, you know, women in our image. So look at verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Translated, make babies. All right? Fill the earth and subdue it. And then down in verse 31 is kind of the conclusion to this. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. God is not offended by our sexuality. God is not surprised by our sexuality. He invented it, he designed it, and he delights in it. When we are expressing ourselves as men and women, as sexual people, within the boundaries and the guidelines that God has established in his word, God thinks it's wonderful. It's part of his plan and his design. And we as the church, as followers of Jesus, have to hold on to that. The realm of sexuality is actually God's. He invited it. Now, it can, it can get corrupted. It can get changed. It can go outside of God's plan. But the actual design itself is a gift from God, and he celebrates it. So should we. That's the first, first truth we have to recognize. Embracing the truth. Here's the second truth. Female and male are a reflection of the image of God, what the theologians and, 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 and you know, leaders in the church would call the imago Dei the image of God. Male and female together are a reflection of the image of God. Look with me at Genesis chapter one, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There is something about the connection of male and female, God's creation of men and women that reveal the fullness of the image of God. In other words, just men can't really reflect the fullness of God's glory and God's image in this world. And just women can't. There's something about how God made us and connects us together that reveal his image, that lift him up. There's something that that is glorious in God's sight and we get a picture of God's presence and power and goodness when we see men and women working together in partnership. One expression of this is in marriage. But some people will say, oh, so you're saying if I'm single, I can't really reflect that full image of God in that relationship. Well, there's lots of ways to be connected. We're connected in the church. We're connected in families. The idea is that th- you know, throughout different settings, when men and women walk together in the way God's designed them to, that together we reflect the image of the living God. That, just, just pause and think about that for a minute. You are part of God's design to reveal his image in this world. And how we relate to each other matters. It's beautiful. It's powerful. There's a beauty to the idea that there are two different kinds of people. Uh, Men and women are distinct and identifiable. And by God's design, we're not the same. Now, I understand that right now in our world, in our culture, there's pushback on that idea. There's people that will say, well, men and women are really pretty much the same. There might be a couple little physiological differences, but for the most part, we're identical. But that's not what the scriptures teach. And that's also not what any of us, if we're honest, experience in the real world. God has designed us intentionally to be different. But we all understand that there is growing confusion in our culture, in our world right now on this topic. Growing, increasing confusion. To the point where something happened recently that I think would have never happened five years ago, ten years ago, any time leading up to our time right now in history. We had a person who was uh, being considered as a nominee for the Supreme Court. And I wrote down the words exactly. In their, in their being vetted and being questioned, uh, a question was asked, can you provide a definition for the word woman? And this person responded, I can't. Now, can I tell you, I believe this person could, but they were afraid. I don't think it was that they didn't understand the difference between men and women. I think that we're in such a conflicted time right now that they were just nervous to actually say anything that somebody might kind of go off on and say, oh, you don't agree with us on this. And so the safer place was to simply say, I can't. You know, I don't have biological expertise, I can't. But, but the reality is, um, I, I believe it was far more out of fear than any sense of not understanding the difference between men and women. In my own journey, in our journey, Sherry and I as a husband and wife, um, as we were getting, you know, as we were raising our boys, uh, and we have three sons, we decided that we wanted to be the ones to teach them about sexuality. We didn't want the schools to do it. We didn't even want the church to do it. 
They, they, these are our boys, our sons. So we decided we would be the ones to teach our children about sexuality. We actually made a decision. We had other people give us just ideas and thoughts about how they had done this. So we decided to, to have one or the other of us take each one for a two-day weekend. The first day would be all just kind of having fun, hanging out, whatever they wanted to do. Go to Six Flags, go do it, just have a fun time. The second day would be learning all about sexuality with great detail. And, and if, you know, Sherry and I were students. We love to learn. So with, you know, with, with drawings and graphics and explanation, I mean, all the details. And then at the end of the day, for two hours, they would teach back everything we taught them so they would, we would make sure they fully understood everything that we had taught them. That was the plan. And so Sherry had this great idea. She said, okay, here's what I'll do. She said, I'll, I'll do that with all the girls. Kevin, you do that with all the boys. <laughs> and I said, okay, it makes sense. And so I remember with each of our, and each of our boys, each time we did this, they, they, it was when they were a little bit younger. We didn't have a set time. We were watching to when we thought they, they would be able to understand and emotionally understand it and, and, and have, make sense of it, and then also be able to keep it to themselves and not tell their friends or their younger brothers, but be mature enough to handle that. And here was the neat thing is with all three, each time it got younger with each one because each time they had more older brothers. And so we were trying to make sure that we, we were the ones that walked them through this. So I remember sitting with each of the boys with a diagram, a drawn diagram of the male anatomy and the female anatomy. And we went, you know, it was very specific teaching and, and, and you know, you know, it was accurate in every way. And so I remember saying to, to each of our boys, I said, okay, now, now this, is the, this is the anatomy of a woman. I said, and in the woman's body right here, there's actually eggs. That, and a, these eggs are half of what it makes, takes to make a human being, to make you, to make me. In that woman. I said, now, do you know that little girls, when they're still in their mother's womb, have those eggs before they're even born? They didn't know that. I said, how many eggs do you think there are in each little girl? in their mother's womb. They didn't know. I said, here's the answer. About a million. Think about the extravagance of God. Some of you are going, really? Is that accurate? Um, <laughs> but yeah, a million. And so we, so we looked, and I, I said, and then looked at the, the diagram of the male anatomy. I said, now in a male, and as, I'm teach, as I taught our boys about this, I said, so in a male, when a man meets a woman who loves Jesus and they get married and they're in marriage together, then they have intimacy together. And I said, so the male has the other half of what it takes to make a baby. It's called a sperm. So it looks like a little tadpole, and I kind of drew it. I said, now each time a husband and a wife are together physically and intimately, I said, I'll explain all that later, but when they're together, the man has the sperm in his body that makes the other half of a baby. I said, how many sperm do you think there are each time a man is with his wife? and they're, they're together intimately. They didn't know. Here's the answer. 200 to 500 million every time. The extra, I, I, said, I said, but the sperm and the egg have to get together. So I looked at each of my boys and I said, do you know how they get together? Some of you are going, tell us, please. Um, but, but I said, but the sperm and the egg have to, and so I did each of my boys, I said, do you know how the sperm gets to the egg? Because these are two separate drawings, right? Two separate people. And, they, and all three of them just did the same thing. They went, And they said, no, which means I, we, I had got a chance to meet with them and talk about this before somebody else did. And I explained to them exactly how that happens. That's way over your head, so I'm going to stop right there. But uh, that's not pulpit stuff. But, but, I, but I, walked through it, I, ex, I, I walked through that with them. I explained to them that genetically females have an XX chromosome, males have an XY chromosome. I walked through differences of men and women that are plain and obvious and made by God. And then I actually asked each of my boys, I said, so... Now you tell me, when you look at men and women, some of the differences that you see. And they were very insightful. They, you know, they, they gave all the physical differences. They got it. They understood it. And so they walked through all that. And then only one, only one of them had a wrong answer. I won't tell you which one, but one of them said, oh, I know one of the differences. I said, oh, what else? What else? He says, well, men have hair on their legs and women don't. <laughs> and I said, well, actually. <laughs> and so, uh, but, but it, was, it, it was an amazing moment to sit with each of my sons and talk about the biblical divine design of men and women, to celebrate that, to talk about what God made. That wasn't that, that, wasn't that long ago, but that's, you know, that, that, was, that was powerful, and as a dad, I, I rejoiced in doing that. So one truth is that God has made us uniquely different. We need to embrace that, embracing the truth. Here's another truth. Sexual intimacy in the biblical context, which is a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage, is about fruitfulness and faithfulness. That, 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 the, that intimacy is about fruitfulness. And so Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. 
One of God's calling was when you're in that relationship to have children. That if you're able to, to have children, there's a beauty to that, there's a glory to that, and we should celebrate that. And until the middle 1800s, there was only one way to do that, which we call the old-fashioned way, with physical intimacy. In the middle 1800s, in a hospital in New York, uh, they found a way to take the egg and to take the sperm and to bring them together outside the body. I mean, that, so, so the world kind of changed then, but up to the middle 1850s, the only way in all of history for anybody to ever have a child was the traditional way, a male and a female, and, and hopefully in that relationship within the covenant of marriage. So we have to understand that part of God's design was a faithfulness in marriage, but also a fruitfulness in marriage. Embracing the truth. Here's another truth. In perfect paradise, God made a man and a woman. When you read Genesis, it's painting a picture for us. It's paradise. It's perfection. It's the beginning. This is how it all started. And God is there with them. And there's a man and a woman. They're naked. They have no shame. God brings them together. God says, be fruitful and multiply. That's part of God's plan. Genesis 2, 20 to 22 says this. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. There's this, there's this picture of Adam and Eve, a man and a woman together. Genesis gives this idea that in perfect paradise, it was very simple. This was God's, it's painting a picture of God's design, a man and a woman in a covenant multiplying in God's sight and walking with God. It's a beautiful picture. My sophomore year of college, I had a class that had a, a component. It was going to a state school here in California, and this is going back four decades, but it's my you know, sophomore year of college, and they had a, a whole section on sexuality, and they had a panel come in and speak, and one of the people on the panel was a person who was a, a person living in a same-sex relationship. They said, well, I'm a homosexual. I'm a Christian homosexual, and so as they were talking, at the end of their presentation, um, we got to ask questions, so I raised my hand, and I said, I said, you know, the Bible it seems to be really clear that God's design is a man and a woman. And I talked about the fact that in how Genesis, at the beginning, Genesis created, you know, when God created the heavens and the earth, he gives us this very clear kind of beginning starting point, this man and the woman in the garden. And this, this person on the panel says, yeah, but you don't get, you don't understand. At that point, there were no other options. I said, exactly. I said, God was showing us in paradise the ideal. That's how it began. That's how it should be. That's God. And even if our world doesn't embrace that, that's God's design. That's God's plan. Uh, and and here's, here's something we have to understand. That the battle with people living outside of God's design. You know, when God, when God made men and women, God said, I want to bring a man and a woman together within the covenant of marriage with that lifelong commitment that their sexuality can be expressed beautifully with no shame, and it's wonderful. And, and people have wandered from that way. People, a lot of people don't follow those guidelines anymore. But you have to understand, back in the first century, when God, the Holy Spirit was inspiring people to write the New Testament and they were addressing these issues, it was because back in the 2,000 you know, years ago, people weren't following God's design. You go back to the Old Testament and find people that weren't following God's design. So God says, this is the ideal. This is what I want for you. This is the point of flourishing and life and things being the best they can. But people live outside of that now, back in Jesus' day, and long before that. that, that that's part of the of the battle and understand that it's been around. It's been around for a long time. This is nothing new. What's new is that it's being pushed more and more and people want people, others to embrace it more and more, but those challenges have been there throughout all history. Embracing the truth. God gave life-giving boundaries from the very beginning. Our God loves his children, so he gave them boundaries in all kinds of areas of life, including their sexuality. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, we see that picture of boundaries. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it, to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. There'll be consequences. So God says there's all these great trees to eat from, but there's a boundary. Stay away from this one. Let me ask you an honest question. Why do parents and grandparents Put boundaries on little ones. Don't run into a busy street to ruin their fun because, oh, it's fun to dodge around cars when they're coming along at 60 miles an hour, right? Why do parents and grandparents put boundaries? Because they love that little kiddo. They, they want to protect them. They know Because the parents and grandparents know more about life and they know what's best. Why does God give us boundaries? 
in every area of life, including our sexuality. Because he made us, he designed us, and he knows what's best for us. Because he loves us. Parents don't give, if you, if you show me a parent or a grandparent who says, I will never give any boundaries at all to my child or grandchild, they can do anything they want. I will tell you that parent or grandparent does not truly love that child. Because they are destined for trouble if there's no boundaries. I'm not going to tell them not to touch a hot burning stove. They'll learn by touching it. And they're scarred for life. I mean, we, we, we say don't touch that because we love them. And so, so God in his love has given boundaries and we have to understand that and embrace that and say, God, you're not trying to ruin our fun or ruin our creativity or tell us what we can't do. You're trying to show us the best life possible. Embracing the truth. Here's another truth we need to embrace. God made women and men to be different and complementary in a beautiful and equal way. That's worded very specifically out of the biblical text. God made women and men to be different. We're made to be different than each other, complementary to each other. Men can help women, women can help men. We become better with each other in a beautiful way, in an equal way. This is not about hierarchy. It's not about one being greater than the other. It's about both being made in God's image and together honoring God. Genesis 2.18 says this. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Hit the pause button for the, there for a moment. I've had people say, I don't like that word helper. You know, that, that, that demeans women. Oh, the woman's the little helper, right? No. You know that word for helper is used again in the Bible? For the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit helps us. If the Holy Spirit, who's the third person of the Trinity, right? If the Holy Spirit is a helper, then, then for God to say, I'm gonna make a helper it's not demeaning. It's actually lifting up. And then in verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, there's intimacy to all this, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. There's this beautiful sense that, that a man and a woman together complement each other. I believe with all my heart that I am a, a better man because Sherry's in my life and influences me. I'm a better man because my mom was in my life and influenced me. I'm a better man because there's women that are part of this church and on our staff that influence me and make me a better man. And I believe that my wife is a better woman because she has me in her life and her, her dad who's still living and part of her life and, and, and other men who have an impact on her life. God makes us better through each other and we should celebrate that. And, 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 sometimes, and there's a real push in our culture right now just to say men and women are the same. There's no difference. Or if there is, it's a, just a tiny little insignificant difference. I think that's unbiblical. I think there's dramatic differences by design, by God's plan. I once heard a man say these words. He said, if me and my wife were identical, one of us would be unnecessary, and I'm pretty sure it would be me. <laughs> right? If we're identical, then we're not needed. Our difference is bring value to each other. And the biblical vision is that God designed the man and the woman differently for his glory, to fully reveal his presence and to reveal his image. It's, it's, it's mysterious, it's beautiful. Our differences are core to who we are as men and women. And no matter what the world may say or what other people might say, it doesn't change the fact that God has designed us the way we are. Now what's interesting is this. Not that long ago, if I were saying these words, people would think, why, were you, why are you saying that? Obviously, of course, men and women are different. 30 years ago, in 1992, there was a book written. And that book was all about the differences between men and women. The dramatic, like they're from different planets almost. All right, the book was called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From... Venus. Some of you read it. Some of you have copies at your home. It sold over 15 million copies. It was on the bestseller list for 121 weeks. I don't think that book would sell very well right now. Because all these people, so many people are saying, well, men and women are really, no, there's no differences. In, any, in really almost any sort of way. 30 years ago, you know, 15 million books were sold on this one theme. Men and women are so different, it's hard to even understand each other. So we get a book to try to understand each other better. Something's happened in the last 30 years. What hasn't happened is that men and women haven't changed. What's happened is the way that the world looks at things. And so we have to understand that just because the world changes, we don't have to change. I believe that biblically, God designed us differently for a reason. Let me ask you a question. How do you build muscle? 
How do you become strong and build muscle? Resistance. You lift weights, you put your pressure, resistance, tension. Things being hard and sometimes conflicted, that's called marriage. All right? Um, God designed men and women differently. My wife and I experience our differences multiple times daily. And we've been married for almost 40 years. I'm crazy about my wife. I love her. I do not understand how she sees the world sometimes. And that's okay. A, a, friend, a friend of mine and a friend of Shoreline, a friend of mine and Sherry's and a friend of Shoreline Church named Gary Thomas. Gary Thomas is one of the top thinkers on Christian marriage in the world today. He wrote this book, Sacred Marriage. It's one of the top selling Christian books on marriage ever written. And he's been here to preach at Shoreline. He's coming here to do a conference for us on September 15th. It's a Thursday. And to preach for us next month, September 18th. If you want to get this book on sacred marriage, this would be helpful. We got them for a discount price in our bookstore in the Connection Center there. But what I love, what I love about this book is it's called Sacred Marriage, but listen, listen to the subtitle of the book. This will tell you the whole theme of the book. Here it is. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? What if God create, created marriage to create attention, to build you stronger, to build spiritual muscle? What if God brought together two different different people, dramatically different people, so that we can become more like Jesus by the struggle and the tension. Yes, the joy, yes, the fun, but also just the, the, that we have to work through things continually. God did not put together in the relationship of marriage two sames. Well, that's, that's too easy. God put together two difference, a man and a woman, because those differences can strengthen us and make us more like Jesus and live a life that honors him. Embracing the truth. One flesh intimacy is both physical and it's spiritual. The, the way that the Bible says he'll make us one is both a physical reality and a spiritual reality. Genesis 2, 22, 23 and 24 says this. It says, the man said, this is when he sees the woman, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife, that's the covenant of marriage, and they become one flesh. That's sexual intimacy. They become one. So there's a physical oneness that happens when you're married in the covenant of marriage with that intimacy that you share together. It's God's design and God says that's very good. There's also a spiritual oneness. There's a way that two people become, we're still separate people, become one person through that covenant of marriage. And so it's both physical and it's sexual. I remember going back to each time I met with my three, each of my three sons and did this two-day weekend. I remember it teaching them and then, then teaching me this, this you know, the, how, how intimacy works in the marriage, how sexual intimacy works. And so I remember sitting there, and I'm not going to give you all the details here, but sitting there, so here's the, here's the diagram of a woman's anatomy, here's the diagram of a man's anatomy. We talked about the eggs, we talked about the sperm. They said they don't know how they get together. And so I said, now, I want you to recognize something. The way that God has designed the body of a man and the body of a woman are like two pieces of a puzzle. And when those two pieces of that puzzle fit together, that's how the egg and the sperm get together. That's enough detail for church time. But with my boys, I was very specific and did a drawing and everything. I said, there's like two pieces of a puzzle. This is why God, God's design is a man and a woman. And so a man and a man and a woman and a woman don't fit together in that way. That oneness, physically and spiritually, is not attained through same-sex relationships. Now, people may say, oh, you're being mean, you're being unkind, you're being unloving. No, I'm just saying what the Bible teaches and what the basic physical world reveals to us. And so we're like two pieces of a puzzle. We have to see the beauty of that and celebrate that. Embracing the truth. This is one of the toughest things I'm going to share today. Embracing the truth, God lets us choose. God lets us choose. He's designed us a certain way. He's designed a pathway and a plan that honors him and that's best for us, that causes flourishing and life. And God wants us to have a life abundant and, and God's plan takes us there. But if you look at the book of Romans, turn to Romans chapter one, if you have your Bibles. In Romans chapter one, there's this picture that God paints to the apostle Paul by the spirit of God that really gives us a, a picture of, of how sin comes into our lives and sort of this, this downward cycle of sin becoming part of our lives, becoming part of our hearts, and then influencing our lives. And it kind of continues on. And three times in Romans 1, three times we hear this, these words, God gave them over. So people are, it says people are involved in sin. And then it says God gave them over. What does that mean? It looks like this. And everybody look at me for a second if you're not looking, if you're online or on campus. It looks like this, where God says, 
I love you and I care about you. But okay, if that's where you're going to go, if that's how you're going to live, if that's what you're going to do, I'm not going to control you, coerce you, or force you. You can do what you choose to do. In a sense, part of me wishes God would not do that, but just say, no, we need to live in his ways. But God gives us the freedom to make choices. And so in Romans chapter 1, beginning of verse 21, we read these words. I'll start in verse 23. It's talking about people were beginning to, to turn from him and turn towards sin. And it says, and they exchanged, people exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds, animals, and reptiles. That's idolatry. So they're getting involved, they're, they're worshiping things other than God. They're falling away from God. Verse 24. Listen to these words. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Things are getting worse and worse. And then what's the next line say? Because of this, God gave them over. God said, like, like a loving parent whose kid is making bad choices, they finally say, you know what? You're 20, you're 25, I can't, I, I just need to let you go. I love you, it's with tears, but I'm gonna let you go. I think God with a broken heart says, I'm gonna give you over. So God gave them over, verse 26 of Romans 1, to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural rela sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for, other, for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, they didn't want to think about God or think about the things of God, then it says, so God gave them over a third time. Remember in the ancient world in literature, when something's repeated three times, it's as much as you can repeat something. If God is holy, he's holy, holy, holy. Well, God gave them over and gave them over and gave them over. I believe with tears and a broken heart saying, I'm not gonna force you to live the way I know you should live. You have to make a decision. And God hoping that they would at some point recognize what they're heading the wrong way and turn their heart back to him. But we have to understand and embrace the truth that God lets us choose our, our decisions about our sexuality. God's made us a certain way. He's given us a path to walk on. We choose if we walk in that path. So now I want to shift gears and talk about engaging in God's good life. How do we sort of engage in the life, if God has a plan, if it's a good plan, if it's a beautiful plan, if it's life-giving, how do we engage in it? So engaging in God's good life, first, we need to recognize, celebrate, and affirm God's good design for us. Christian people need to let boys be boys and men be men and rejoice in that and not be embarrassed by that. To let girls be girls and women be women and rejoice in it. And so there's people now that are afraid to even, you know, use certain words about, you know, I'm, I'm so, a boy, boy, I, I love how my boy is growing up to be a wonderful young man. You know, so some people are like, well, what's that mean? It means that I rejoice that he's becoming who God's designed him to be and God's made him to be. We need to celebrate the wonder and the beauty and the goodness of God's good design. That God has uniquely made males and females. And he's made us different for a reason. We should celebrate that. We should see those differences and rejoice that parents and grandparents should say, you are such a beautiful little girl. And I, I love the young woman you're becoming. I celebrate that. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be embarrassed about that. That's God's design. Parents should look at a, at a little girl and say, you're such a beautiful young girl. You're becoming a wonderful, beautiful young woman. If we don't celebrate that in our world today, who's going to? We need to celebrate those things. We need to bless often, often, just what it means to be male and female. And we need to celebrate the beauty of marriage between a man and a woman. You know, here at Shoreline Church, we don't do civic ceremonies. We're not, we're not agents of the state. So our pastors never sign marriage certificates. If people want to get married, they go to the state. And, we, and I tell people, you can go to the county, to the state, they'll do paperwork, and that means you can file your taxes together. It doesn't mean you're one. That happens before the living God. We do covenant celebrations of Christian marriage. We join people together in the sight of God. Now you need to get, render to Caesar what's Caesar's, to God what is God's, the Bible, Jesus said that. And so if someone wants to get, go through a covenant of Christian marriage at Shoreline, they have to get the state's paperwork first. But they don't, be, and we tell them, but you're not married yet. That's paperwork. Now you need to be married before God. We take it, we take it that seriously. But we should celebrate the beauty of covenantal marriage in the sight of God. Engaging in God's good life. How do we do that? Beware of the costs and consequences of living outside of God's design. 
we should be honest and humble that when God says this is the way to live in any area of life, when we walk off that path, there's always consequences, there's always costs. We may not see them right away, that might be immediate or long term, but there's always costs. In the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter five, actually there's three chapters that are dealing with issues of sexual sin, people walking out of God's boundaries for sexual expression. And in Proverbs chapter five, verses three and five, we read this. For the lips of an adulterous woman drip honey. This is a woman who's married, but she's out looking for sex with someone that she's not married to. It says, for the lips of an adulterous woman drip honey. It looks delicious. It's going to taste delicious. Her speech is smoother than oil. This is going to be great. Verse four says, but in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword, and her feet go down to death. Sexual sin always looks good. Sweet like honey, smooth like oil. And there's a consequence or consequences. We might find out immediately or long term. When we step out of God's design, out of God's good plan, we have to prepare to grapple with the consequences. Now, I want to be clear as your pastor that you say, well, well, you're talking about sexual sin kind of in some specific way, some vague. Let me be really specific. I'm going to walk through five different kinds of sexual sin that are a picture of walking off of the path. God's design is a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage together, and then God says, it's good, it's very good, it's wonderful. We live in a world now where almost anything goes, and we might have heard so much in the world and seen so much in the world or watched a a family member go through something and and changed our view from the biblical view to the cultural view because it kind of makes it easier. But I want to clearly define what some aspects of sexual sin are. Here's one of the biblical words, adultery. Adultery is when a person is married and they're having sexual intimacy with someone besides their spouse. Or they're not married and they're having sexual intimacy with somebody who is married. The Bible says that's called adultery. That's not God's plan. It doesn't lead to the flourishing life that God wants. It doesn't make God say, this is very good. And there's always consequences if you walk down that road. Here's another word, fornication. So what's fornication? It's two people who aren't married, who aren't married at all who are involved in sexual intimacy. You say, well, wait a minute. Every, that's, that's, everyone does that. Well, it doesn't change the fact that God says that's not his plan. So if two people aren't married, they're in high school, they're in college, they're, they're, they're in their 20s or 30s and not married, well, I just kind of live my life. Into, but God says, that's not my design. That doesn't lead to human flourishing. Homosexuality. That's sexual relations between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And God says, that's not my design. That's not, those are two sames instead of two different. It's not how I've designed this to be expressed. So it doesn't lead to human flourishing. It doesn't lead to what God's designed. And it has consequences over time. Transgenderism. Transgenderism is when a person, God has made a person male or female, and they say for whatever reason, out of pain and brokenness or struggle or the pressure of culture, they say, well, I think I'm something other than what God's designed me, and I'm going tra- you know, to kind of change to the other gender, or I'm going to work between genders. And, and God says, that's not my design. He's, he's made us male and female in his image. Polyamorous relationships which happened in the ancient world and are happening more and more in our world today, where people say, well, I'm going to be in a relationship with four or five people, and have intimacy with a group of people. That's happening in our world today. And God says, that's not my design. That's not my plan. That doesn't lead to human flourishing. Uh, there's other, other aspects of it, but what I want you to see is that God's design is, is to have a pathway we walk that brings life and abundant life. And I spent a lot of time doing some research on statistics and the numbers about what things are increasing, what's happening in our culture, how people see this, and what was profound to me is I could find data, scientific studies and data that showed exactly the opposite. Because right now, we're in a world where science tends to uh, follow, here's the conclusion we want, we're going to find scientists that agree with that, and we're going to build our case. So I'm not going to throw a bunch of data out at you, but what struck me was the breadth of different perspectives from a scientific worldview. But all of them, everybody, showed that that these different kinds of living outside of God's design are all increasing in our world right now. Everyone agrees on that, is that it's increasing a lot. And so we need to think about this as Christians and recognize this. Uh, We have to recognize that in our culture right now, there's there's views of sexuality that are radically different than what this book says. And if as parents, as grandparents, as family members, as friends with people, you you can not affirm how someone's living and still love them. That's one of the biggest lies of the enemy right now is that if you don't affirm everything somebody does, you don't love them. But I don't affirm everything that anybody, I mean, there's nobody I've met who's perfect. I don't, I don't affirm everything that I do. And so the idea, you can't love someone if you don't affirm everything they do is, is, not, a, is not fair. And one of the big concerns in my heart right now, and, and, and people are, there are studies being done on this, is that a lot of the different sexual paths people are walking are growing regionally. 
Certain areas, they're increasing far more than other areas because it's becoming almost a fad. Almost a, people are into it. And, they're, and I, I have a group of about 50 pastors I meet with um, for a multiple day retreat. We do this, try to do this every year, uh, all from the Bay Area, all the way from, from above San Francisco down here to Monterey and kind of all the central California coast. And I cannot tell you how many pastors I've been talking to who will say young people, middle school and high school, kids in where they live, there's a huge pressure to not just be a boy or a girl. There's huge pressure to, be, to, have, a, to have a different pronoun, to have a different um, orientation, to be fluid, to be transgender. There, there's actual social and peer pressure to live in ways that are inconsistent with God's design. And, that, and it's growing. And, and I, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about, you know, like when my kids were growing up, there were fads. And the problem is some of these things are becoming almost like a fad where the society is pushing it, the media is pushing it, Hollywood's pushing it, um, and, and there's young people confused and then they start walking down these roads uh, that, that aren't something that they really thought about, but that people are saying, this, maybe it's this. And when my kids were, were growing up, it was like, they, they, one of the, the fads was Pogs. Another fad was Pokemon. Anybody remember Pokemon cards? Uh, Beanie Babies, all right? Well, those were fads. And people were like, oh, if you buy these Beanie Babies, then they're going to be worth thousands. You'll put your kids together uh, through college just on what you make from your Beanie Babies. Guess what? They're all in a box, and you know what they are? They're Beanie Babies. They're, they're, they're little animals filled with little beans. That's all they are. They're not worth a whole lot. But, but those were fads. Now, you have fads that involve giving gender blockers to children, 5, 8, 10, 12 years old. Children that are too young to go to the office at their school and get an aspirin. The nurse can't give them an aspirin. But people are saying they can choose to change their sex and have their bodies, have chemicals put in their bodies, have uh, hormone blockers put in that will, that will irreparably change them. You cannot turn it around. The science is absolutely not there for any of these things. I've talked to some medical doctors, medical doctors part of our church, who said there is no science to... to validate these things. People who would be offended if you did scientific tests on baby mice. They say, I, I, I'm, for, I'm, I'm for animals. I, I support animals. I don't want you doing tests on mice. But they're doing tests on boys and girls that are 8 years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. Irreparable. And, and, and you go beyond just the hormone blockers to actual surgeries to change the physical built makeup, the God-designed makeup of little girls' bodies and little boys' bodies. And part of me looks at it and says, you know, if you bought 20 Beanie Babies and they're sitting in a box somewhere and you lost a few bucks on them, no big deal. But letting a child change themselves irreparably, physically or chemically, with hormone blockers. We need to slow this train down. Christian parents and grandparents, um, you're, you're, you... I don't know how you come at these things, but we need to pray and seek the Lord and look at the word of God and not just take, well, cultures embrace us, so we're racing down the road because this, this thing's gone. I think, I think as a culture, we're gonna look back in the not too distant future and say, what did we do? We looked the other way. The psychological community jumped on the bandwagon before real medical research was even done and consequences were weighed because of social pressure. It, it's, it's a... Our hearts need to love kids in a way that we would say we've got to ask the hard questions and grapple with things. And then in our culture right now, as, as we have influence on the next generation, you know, when I was a kid and when my boys were kids, if, if, a, boy, if a boy said, I don't like girls, you know, if, if a five-year-old boy or a seven-year-old boy said, I don't like, I, I don't like girls, They're, they have cooties, they're gross, I don't like girls. Parents would say, oh, just be patient. You will someday when you get a little bit older. You're, you're still a kid. You'll grow up. Now, parents might say, oh, well, then maybe you like boys to a boy who struggles. I don't like girls. Every boy I knew growing up didn't like girls because that's what little boys feel. But now instead of saying, just give it time, people say, well, maybe you like boys. A little girl says, I don't feel like a girl. I don't feel pretty, which a lot of little girls don't feel pretty when they're little. You know, they're, they're growing up, they're, 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 they're in awkward times, middle school, high school, their bodies are changing. And they say, I don't really like being a girl. And people say, oh, that, that's okay, girls feel that way sometimes, but just be patient. Now people say, well, then maybe you need to change. And people will push them down that road. And we, we just 
need to understand that things have changed so rapidly, so quickly in these areas. We've got to seek God, read the scriptures, grapple with this, and, and understand that um, we can't be part of that pressure, and we have to be part of lovingly speaking the truth. Now, let me be really clear as a pastor. There are a lot of people who deal with a lot of pain and a lot of brokenness and a lot of struggles. And, and one of the reasons I didn't want any, you know, I didn't want people clicking out or even cheering on is because this is complicated. These are real people with real lives, with real pain and real struggles. And if all the places there should be incredible compassion and love and grace and open arms, it's the church. That's why it bothers me so much when people say, if you don't agree, you hate someone and you should walk away from them. That's not true. That's not true. I did all kinds of stuff growing up that my parents didn't agree with me, trust me. And they never stopped loving me. And I knew they loved me. I knew they didn't like what I was doing, but I knew that they loved me. And we can walk with people through whatever they go through. Engaging in God's good life. The gift of confession and repentance. In any kind of way that we may wander off God's design and God's path. And along the way, most of us have struggles with asking questions, struggling with things. But when we wander off that path, there's a gift of confession and repentance. Psalm 51. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Psalm 51 is David, King David, who is lifting up a prayer, writing a prayer after he has committed adultery. He, David has taken another man's wife, been intimate with her, and then had her husband killed. And God gets a hold of his heart and breaks his heart, and he finally realizes what he's done is wrong. And he comes before God in verse one of Psalm 51, and he prays this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to God, to your great compassion. He understands the love of God. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquities. Cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, God, you only have I sinned. I've done what's evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict. You're justified when you judge. But he cries out and says, but God, forgive me. And here's the thing, God does. God's grace is greater than our comprehension. God's grace is greater than we understand. In 1 John 1, 9, we're told that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as we walk into God's good life, we also walk like Jesus, and that's in the balance of grace and truth. This is huge. If you're a follower of Jesus, or if you're not a Christian, but you become a Christian, we have to walk in this balance of grace and truth, of kindness and gentleness and mercy and grace and truth and commitment and not compromising on God's truth. And so in John 1, 14, the Gospel of John, it's talking about the coming of Jesus. The Word became flesh. The Word is Jesus, the Messiah. The Word became flesh. He made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was always gracious, and he always spoke the truth. That's what Christians need to do. We follow the example of Jesus. In John chapter 8, there's a story of a woman caught in the act of adultery. One of the ways of walking off God's plan. She, she was obviously being intimate with a man, who wasn't, uh, a man who was married to someone else. And she gets caught in the act. She's brought into the temple courts. She's placed in front of Jesus because he's teaching there. And the people say, the law says she should be executed. People should take rocks and throw them at her until she's dead. That's what the law says. Jesus, what do you say? And Jesus says to the, all of them, the one of you that has never sinned, get us started. You throw the first stone. And then it says Jesus bent down and started drawing in the ground. The woman's standing there in judgment with his crowd. Jesus says, the one of you that's never sinned, you throw the first stone. And he just bends down and writes in the ground. And here's what we read in verse 9 of John 8. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, leaving the courtyard. The older ones first, I think because they were older, had more time to sin, and they realized what Jesus was saying. The older one's left first until only Jesus was left with a woman standing there. Here, here's this woman standing in judgment still. All the crowd's gone. They've dropped their rocks. Jesus is writing on the sand. And then, so it says, Jesus straightened up. He stood up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Now listen to this. Then neither do I condemn you, grace. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin truth. Neither do I condemn you. Go leave your life of sin. That's how we need to walk and live as followers of Jesus. To love people, to walk with them, but to not to compromise. So as we close, 
I want to give you just a couple of quick reflections as we move forward. Here's one, my posture as a pastor. I walk with people who are part of this church, who battle all kinds of sexual sins, things I've talked about and things I haven't even talked about. And when I talk with them, when I pray with them, when I walk with them, they know I love them. They know that God loves them. They know this church is open to them. But they also know that I don't agree with how they're living because the Bible says they're not living the right way. I've had lots of those conversations. But those people remain friends and people I love. You can love each other and disagree. You really can. And I can say that's true of all of our pastors, all of our leaders here. Shoreline's approach to people who are dealing with sexual sin. This is a good place to be. It's a good place to grapple with it. Because you can be here working through that. No one's going to kick you out. Nobody's going to beat you up. We're going to say, hey, we want to walk with you as you seek to become all that God wants you to be. I've had people ask me, visitors coming to the church, thinking about joining Shoreline Church. I've had this happen on a number of occasions. They'll come to me and they'll say, we're thinking of joining this church, but we want to hear from you right now that you will never stand up in the pulpit and talk about this or that sexual sin and say it's wrong. We want to know you'll never say that. I'll say, all I can do is I can promise you, if you're here long enough, you're going to hear this whole book, and this book deals with sexual sin, you're going to hear that. I cannot promise you that. What I will promise you is you will hear it with grace, the truth of the Bible expressed. And they'll say, well, then that will mean we can't come to this church. And I'll say, that's your decision. But I I said, but I hope you would come here and be here and hear those things on occasion and maybe be a little bit uncomfortable. I hope if you're uncomfortable today because you don't agree, I hope you don't say, I got to leave this church, but you'd say, no, I can be part of this church even when we disagree. And so we're going to continue preaching on those things. The end of Romans, that cycle in chapter one, the closing verse says this, and it's a very sobering verse. It talks about how, how all these people were involved in these different sins. God gave them over. God gave them over. Different sins. God gave them over. Different sins. Sexual, but lots of different kinds of sins. God gave, and then finally it says this in verse 32 of Romans 1. They not only continue to do these very things, all these different sins, but also approve of those who practice them. That's become our culture. Do whatever you want. Nobody really cares. In the church, if we love people, we're going to say, we love you, we'll walk with you, but we do care, and we're going to challenge you to live differently in every area, whether it's how you deal with your finances or in your marriage or sexuality. In every area, you will be challenged along the way. Two more thoughts. Here's a question. Are people struggling with sin of all kinds welcome here at Shoreline? Are people struggling with sin of all kinds welcome at Shoreline? I want you to look at me as I answer this. Are people struggling with all kinds of sin welcome at Shoreline? Here's my answer. Yes, I am. Your pastor struggles with sin in my thoughts, in my words, in my actions. And if it weren't for the grace of Jesus, I'd be off the deep end. He loves me, he forgives me, and as time goes on, I become more and more like him. But it's still a battle at times. Pastor Sean is not perfect. He struggles with sin. My wife Sherry is perfect. No, my wife Sherry is not perfect. She struggles with sin. It's, are you welcome here if you struggle with sin of any kind? Yes, you are. And finally, one last thought. I recognize that this sermon is opening a conversation, not ending the conversation. And so if you want to talk about some of these things, if you want to pray about these, if you want to look at Christian counseling, if you want a good podcast or book or resource, to, we, we have all kinds of resources we can make available to you. What we want to hear is we want to talk with you one-on-one for you or someone you love and care about and, and not like, okay, here's the answer, but here's some things that would help you on this journey. We want to walk with you, talk with you, pray with you. I don't see this as the end of the discussion. I see this as the beginning. So you can talk with any of our pastors. If you want to go deeper, we would love to. We'll set up a time to have someone meet with you, talk with you. If we're in over our head on what you're dealing with, we'll find somebody who's smarter than us, who can help you, but we want to walk with you as a church. Does that make sense? I understand this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end. And so Jesus, this is our prayer. We pause and we thank you, O oh God, that in the beginning, in your image, you made us male and female, you created us. And you said this is very good. We pray that we would understand your design and your plan for our lives Where we wander from it, Lord, bring us back in line with your grace and your truth. If we're choosing to walk away from you and not live in the ways you have planned for us, Lord, help us to understand that you never stop loving us. Your arms are always open. The door is always open to come back home again. Help us to understand your plan, your love, and your ways. Help us to rejoice and celebrate who you have made us as men and women. And help us protect particularly the little ones in a culture that is inviting people and challenging people and enticing people to things that could cost them for the rest of their life. And let us have the wisdom and the grace to walk with them and help them see things more clearly. 
Let this church be a place where we always express your grace and we never compromise the truth. For the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I ask you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I would like to give you an invitation. We're doing a class today in about 15 minutes at 1230 called Foundations. It's all about the basic foundations of the Christian life. Sherry and I are going to teach it today, and it'll, it'll be on campus up in the garden room and online at 1230, live stream online. Um, and so we're teaching it today, and then Keith and Sean are teaching it next week, same time, 12.30 to 2 o'clock. Here's who should come to that class. And maybe you're saying, maybe this is for me, if, it's, if you're here on campus right now. If you are new in faith, brand new in faith, and you want to learn the basics, you want to be there. If you've been a Christian like for the last year, but you're like, i got to go back and understand the basics, you should show up and join us. We've actually got a light lunch provided on campus here. It's in about 15 minutes up in the garden room, up the stairs here. But also, if you've been a Christian for a long time, but you're saying, I just, I'd like to go back and get my basics again. I want to make sure I'm on the right path. Say, so I've been in the church for 20 years, but man, I, the foundation, I'd like to look at that. We'd love to have you be a part of that. So in 15 minutes, that starts in the garden room and online. If you want prayer uh, for anything, if you're online, we have a phone number there and an email address, so reach out to us, let us pray for you. If you're on campus, outdoors by the big screen TV and here in the front of the church, teams that who would, they, nothing would make them happier than you coming and giving them the honor of praying for you today. And if you're new at Shoreline, if you're online, just text the word welcome to the phone number you see on your screen right now, and we will reach out to you, give you a warm personal welcome. If you're in the worship center, family worship venue, or out in the courtyard, um, just go to the connection center right here in the lobby. They want to give you a little gift bag, answer your questions, give you a warm personal welcome. If you're able to stand, I'd invite you to stand with me so I can send you off with a word of blessing. As we close this time together, may you go as men and women rejoicing in how God has made you, blessing others for how God has made them, and with grace and compassion, walking with people who are struggling, holding to the truth, sharing the truth in grace. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you back here next Sunday. We're going to kick off a new series next week. Have a great week.